I want to welcome everyone to this evening's Iowa Senate District 38 debate. My name is Elizabeth Montalvo, President of the Northern Iowa Student Government. I want to thank the four nonpartisan organizations who are sponsoring this debate, namely Women of Action, Panther Vote, Cedar Falls Waterloo Branch of the American Association of University Women of Iowa, and the organization I represent, Northern Iowa Student Government. Next, I want to extend my thanks to our two moderators for assisting us conduct a fair and civil debate this evening, namely Jamie Renfro, Professor of Political Science at the University of Northern Iowa, and Christopher Larimer, Professor, professor of Political Science at UNI. Our timekeeper for tonight's debate is Joshua Walsh, NISG's Vice President. We are grateful to the City of Cedar Falls for permitting us to host the debate in the Council Chambers as well as to personnel associated with the Cedar Falls Cable Channel 15 for broadcasting this debate. Both of our candidates, in alphabetic order, incumbent Senator Eric Giddens and Dave Sires, have been apprised of the protocol for this evening, but I'm repeating it so our audience is in the know as well. Each of our candidates will be permitted to give a two-minute introductory statement, a one-minute closing statement, and the responses to debate questions should not exceed for one minute. Should any candidate want to make a rebuttal comment, they will be limited a 30 second, sec seconds to make their case. Moderators have, been, have permission to stop the rebuttal commentary if they feel the issue has sufficiently been aired. The timekeeper will apprise candidates when they have 15 seconds left of their allotted time and a stop sign will be displayed to apprise candidates their time has expired. Due to our limited time, one hour, we have allocated for tonight's debate, I ask both candidates to not exceed their allotted time period. Should a candidate go beyond their allotted time period, the moderators and timekeepers have the debate sponsor's permission to interrupt him, move on to the next question, or rebuttal slash debate slash discussion opportunity, and, if necessary, penalize the candidate's time the next time he is asked to respond to a question. Residents of Iowa Senate District 38 were able to submit questions either online or by telephone, and all questions to be asked tonight came from those residents. Representatives of our debate sponsors have reviewed all submitted questions, have categorized the questions by topic, and gave the questions to our moderators only 30 minutes prior to tonight's debate. Due to the professional background of our moderators, they have been given the privilege to modify questions, should they so desire, for the sake of clarity. The moderators will try to alternate which candidate is to be the first to answer a citizen inquiry. Prior to the debate, a coin flip determined which candidate would go first, and as a result, Senator Giddens will start our debate by giving his two-minute introductory remarks. Mr. Giddens, please begin. Thank you and good evening. Uh, I first want to thank the organizers of tonight's event, uh, the moderators, Mr. Sires, for this opportunity to uh, participate in this debate. I'm Eric Giddens. I'm the state senator here in Senate District 38, which covers Cedar Falls, Hudson, um, Evansdale, Elk Run Heights, Gilbertville, Washburn, LaPorte City in Blackhawk County, um, Traer and Dysart in Tama County, and the community of Mount Auburn in Northwest Benton County. Um, I uh, was a, a, I'm a former school teacher, a public school teacher here in Cedar Falls. I taught ninth grade math at Peter, uh, Pete Junior High School, uh, later worked at the Tallgrass Prairie Center and the Center for Energy and Environmental Education at the University of Northern Iowa here in town. Um, in 2017, I was elected to the school board here in Cedar Falls. Uh, 2019, I was elected to the state senate. I uh, had to run again in 2020, uh, ran again in 2020, was re-elected to a four-year term that's coming to a close right now. I'm running for re-election to continue representing the, uh, the citizens of Senate District 38. In the state Senate, I am the ranking member of the Commerce Committee. Uh, I am also on the education, transportation, state government, agriculture, appropriations, uh, which is the committee that sets our state budget, and the agriculture and natural resources budget subcommittee. Um, I'm also I'm ranking member as well of that ag and uh, natural resources budget subcommittee. I've previously served on the Ways and Means Committee and on the Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, had previous leadership roles as ranking member on the Transportation and Veterans Affairs Committee. 
uh, I look forward to this debate tonight. I think this is going to be a great opportunity for us to discuss the opportunities and the challenges that we face here in Senate District 38 and the potential policy solutions that we should be looking at to advance this district and our state. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the sponsors for having Eric and I here tonight. Northern Iowa Student Government, Women of Action, Panther Vote, Cedar Falls Waterloo Branch of the American Association of University Women. I'm Dave Sires. I'm a lifelong Iowan. I was born and raised in Cedar Falls, so was my wife. Between us, we have three adult children, four grandchildren, and all living here in Iowa. My mother's 96. My father-in-law is 97. So with my family right now, I span almost 100 years of Iowa. This is quite a span. I'm a businessman. I farmed. I owned an excavating business and bought my parents out 34 years ago with their manufactured housing community and then added on a self-storage facility. I've been endorsed by the Farm Bureau as a friend to agriculture, very seldom done to a challenger. I'm honored to be chosen to represent the Republican Party and run for the Senate seat. I served the Cedar Falls City Council for four years. And while I served, I worked hard to keep spending down and taxes low, often asking questions that came from my experiences in my different businesses. After the end of last year, the taxes went up almost 9%, and that was just a very short time after I got off the city council. I decided to run for state senate because I want to continue the trend of conservative spending and low taxes. I also see the erosion of family values, quality education, and just plain good old Iowa common sense. Hard work is one of our mottos, all of us, everyone here. For the last six years, most of us have not been rented from District 38, as Senator Giddens has voted no on many common sense issues, and keeping boys from playing in girls' sports, and keeping boys out of the girls' bathrooms. I told Senator Giddens that I'd always be a sportsman-like, and he is all as well. There's probably only one thing we agree on, and that we are basically opposite from end to end. I will represent you in Des Moines with common sense and Iowa values while keeping Iowa a great place to work, live, and raise a family. Thank you for attending tonight, whether in person or on TV. Thank you. Thank you both for being here tonight. This question is to both of you. Mr. Cyrus will ask that you respond first, and then Mr. Giddens. Over 400 professionals have left the area education agencies. Do you support the new law that overhauls the services and funding for the AEAs? And are you confident that the needs of special education students will be met, particularly in rural communities? Well, what I'd like to start out with is an analogy, and it's the best one that I could think of for what the AEA is going through. We raced cars. I also raced motorcycles. But if you have a team and you have the owner, which would be the state, you have a mechanic, you have all these different things. And you've got to figure out where to put your money. You don't spread it out evenly. You figure out where it needs to go first and then drive at that. We've raised the wages for starting teachers and people with 12 years of experience. We need to figure out where we need to cut and where we need to add on. The thing about me is I'm super competitive. And for us to be down at number 41 with the AEA is just wrong. In 1979, when my wife and I both graduated from Cedar Falls High School, Cedar Falls High School was number one in the state, and Iowa was number one in the nation. We've fallen far below that. And I don't accept that because Iowans are as smart as anybody, and with our hard work, we can get things done and make Iowa still the greatest place to work, raise, and educate a family. Thank you. Mr. Giddens? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm glad that this was the first issue that came up because it was the issue that sucked all of the oxygen out of the Iowa Capitol this past year. Uh, this was an unwanted uh, bill that is going to completely undermine the, um, the ability of our AEAs to provide the services that they're able to. Uh, and I, I received 3,000 plus emails, not a single one of them from a person who, was, who wanted to see this bill happen the way that it happened. Uh, you know, I and pretty much everybody involved have said that all organizations have, uh, have room to improve, but hiring an out-of-state consultant 
uh, from the state of Virginia who writes a report and did not involve or consult with anybody in the state of Iowa about that bit about what was going to go into that bill is the wrong way to improve a system you need to get all the stakeholders together in a room come up with some solutions that uh, that we can work on together to improve the thing that's the way we needed to approach that and I was totally opposed to, to the bill thank you I'd like to rebut that please <laughs> The, the issue is not that we don't want to make things better for everybody, but the issue is, is we're spending $5,300 more than the national average, and we're finishing in the bottom 20%. I, I think that's very uncalled for. We need to figure out. We know, need to go to a state where, where they are number one or two or three and have them come in and help us. That's all. I have the 30 seconds as well. Uh, the, the statistics that you're referencing have been almost completely debunked. Uh, the, they were based on, you know, false n numbers about student achievement from special needs uh, areas. Uh, this, this bill uh, in additionally did nothing to <laughs> improve outcomes for special needs students. It, the parts of the AEA that it reformed uh, that changed will not touch special needs services. So. Um, that there's just no basis, in fact, to, to what Mr. Size is saying. Thank you both. So apropos of uh, my esteemed colleague here and I sitting here, the University of Northern Iowa is in this district, and uh, we're wondering what could or should the legislature do to enhance this asset that the state has? And we'll start with Mr. Giddens this time. A uh, strong supporter of University of Northern Iowa. No doubt it is an educational leader, one of our three regents universities, the most unique institution in the state uh, in the system of higher education. Um, uh, educates 90% 90, 90 of the students are from Iowa. Um, of the ones that come into the state of Iowa to attend UNI, half of those wind up staying in the state, which is a huge workforce engine for our state in a time when we have workforce challenges, uh, the business and community services outreach organizations at UNI um, do over a billion dollars worth of economic impact in the state every year. Uh, culturally, the, the importance cannot be overstated uh, of the University of Northern Iowa here to our district. So, uh, unfortunately, it has been underfunded. Uh, state funding has lagged, and, and we, need, we need more funding from the state. Uh, you and I and the Regents Universities are a combination, funded by a combination of tuition and state appropriations. When you don't get enough state appropriations, you've got to raise tuition, everything gets out of balance, and then the enrollment uh, spiral continues to happen. So I'm out of time, but I could go on and on about my support for you and I. Thank, Thank you. you. Dave, or Mr. Cyrus. Yeah, UNI is one of the proudest things we have here in Cedar Falls. Those students that come here are the lifeblood of this community. I grew up right around UNI. When we would work the construction field that was out just a mile from the Campanile, we could turn our transit on when it was almost the end of the day and watch the time so we could quit right at five o'clock. UNI brings a tremendous amount of money to Cedar Falls. We need to fund them, but we need a seat at the table because everybody down there is a Republican. We need a Republican to us, represent us down there so that we're easier to grab those funds and bring them to you and I. The other thing we need to do is we need to get rid of our state income tax, and that will keep and hold the people here. The better we can grow our economy, the more students we can go ahead and use in a better way to help grow our economic development. Thank you. Would you like to rebut? Yes, please. Uh, w without state income tax, without state revenue, I'm not sure how we're going to fund the University of Northern Iowa. We have to have revenue in order to um, fund our priorities, including you and I. There's, there's no way around that. Uh, unless you want to double or triple our sales tax, which I don't think anybody's interested in doing. Um, uh, as far as a seat at the table goes, Mr. Sires, you had a seat at, the, at this table here mm -hmm. in Cedar Falls at the Cedar Falls City Council, and I didn't see any efforts to work with your colleagues or with city staff or uh, with anybody uh, here locally to try to advance the community. I'm not sure how joining the Republican caucus um, that you, know, you want to at State House is going to really advance that or help mm -hmm. our community. Thank you. I'd like to read about that, of course. Well, here's the thing. Before you got on there, we had a senator who did get us money and more money. 
And with that, as an economics major from UNI, and my wife graduated from there when UNI was number one in the nation for accounting. What we need to do, it's, it's old Reaganomics, called supply-side economics. Well, that's what I learned when I was in college. So if we can get rid of these state taxes and bring in more jobs, it's better for everybody. Thank you. All right, this next question will start with you, Mr. Cyrus. How do we stop the brain drain from Iowa, and what would you do to make the state more attractive for young Iowans to stay? What we need to do is, like I just said, we need to work on our economy in this state. And some of the things, like the zero income tax, are things that Florida has done and have a tremendous amount more people move there. We need to get companies and businesses that work here. We need to be easy on corporations that provide jobs. We need to not beat everybody up. We need to have a freer society that doesn't have as many taxes and as many regulations. It's the regulations that hurt the businesses, and it could go on and on. But our economic development and our farmers, they're the ones that have always brought Iowa through to make it a great place that it is. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd kind of add on to what I previously talked about with supporting our higher education institutions and, and the full spectrum of education from, from kindergarten, pre-K, all the way up through our Regents Universities and other higher ed institutions. Um, I'd, I'd add that we need to cut out the culture war uh, distractions. There are so many things that are brought up every year in this state, in the state house, that are absolute distractions that nobody's really interested in, that aren't real problems, that aren't gonna advance our uh, communities, aren't gonna advance our state economy. What we need to be working on are real economic development um, initiatives. Uh, I, I attend the Grow Cedar Valley meetings, I attend uh, meetings of all economic development uh, organizations in the area here. I talk to folks, those professionals, about what they're interested in seeing state government do, and I go back to Des Moines and I do all I can uh, to, to collaborate and try to support their priorities. And I think that's the kind of leader it takes to really, um, to really advance the state and to, to work on this brain drain problem, keep our talented young people here in the state. Thank you. I'd like to rebut that. As he said, a lot of things get in the way. Uh, some of the bills that he sponsored, he sponsored natural reduction of human remains. I think that's something that's not going with economic development. Um, we have to look at what we're doing. He wants rent control on mobile home parks. I didn't know he had any experience in manufactured housing. And I think that's pretty crazy because that's been my business my entire life. That's all. Thank you. I, I have no idea what you're talking about, natural reduction of human remains. Um, I, I can look it up for you. Well, I'd, I'd Right here on page it. 15 in the middle. Pa page 15 of what? Page 15. It's a bill enacting relating to the natural reduction of human r remains. I don't, I don't have that okay. document. And here it is. All right, I'm going I'm to I'm stop this right now. You guys yeah. can duke that out afterward if you'd yeah. like to. Okay. Well, I, I, I Senate file 407. I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you, do you want a, do you want a 30 second? Y yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I'd, I don't know what that was. Um, there, yeah, I'll, I'd be happy to look at that later, but uh, the, the, the brain drain is a real problem. We have a population problem here in the state. It absolutely is a real problem that needs to be addressed. I hold forums at UNI and ask young people what they want, and what I hear is they want less distractions, they want more freedom of bodily autonomy and things that the state keeps taking away from them. Um, those are the kind of things that young people want, and we need, to, we need to listen to them. We need to do what they want. So in, on a related note, Iowa currently ranks near the bottom for OBGYN services. In fact, there are many counties in Iowa which do not have obstetrical services available at all. What do you see as the cause for this problem and what could you do about it? We'll start with Mr. Giddens. Uh, yes, so the special session that was held last year, uh, the six-week abortion ban, was a huge problem. Uh, as you noted, I was already 50 out of 50 states for OBGYNs per capita. Uh, it was all it was very, very difficult to attract, um, hire, and, and retain OBGYNs in this state before the bill passed last year. 
Uh, now I've talked to OBGYNs who say that it's all but impossible to hire OBGYNs now. They're, gonna, they're not going to come to this state. They're going to go to other states. We have a huge maternal health care here problem in the state. We have maternal health care deserts. Some women have to travel 60 miles or more to get maternal health care. Many, many counties across the state have no OBGYN at all in the county. Um, and, and this is only making it worse. It's making it less safe for, for women to um, uh, bear and deliver uh, children here in this state. And uh, I think it's just wrongheaded and taking us in, in a backward direction. I was born at Sartori Hospital, so was my wife. Um, Dr. Young was the one that, de that uh, delivered all my kids, and on the first one was 1986, and that's when we lost it at Sartori Hospital, and then we had to go to Waterloo. So he'd be a good one to be able to ask that, but the thing we got to do is we got to protect the doctors from, from these horrendous lawsuits because that's what's truly hurting them. When they can't come here, and if you look at a lawsuit where the jury decided what the penalty damage was for, for pain and suffering, the one was $97 million. So we've gotta look at capping that and get that done, and then I think maybe we could get a lot more people, a lot more doctors to Iowa. I, Would you like to revive it? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I, I really do wish we could ask Dr. Young uh, some questions, but we can't. We're the two that are up here. Uh, I, I would say um, that when you criminalize somebody's health care profession, that's what makes them not want to work in the state. And that's essentially what has happened here. Um, this, the the OBGYN profession has been criminalized when they're put in positions to try to help a patient make a life-saving decision. Um, if they make the wrong decision, try to provide that care, they're, they're threatened with their license. So um, that's the reason they don't want to practice here in Iowa. Mr. Cyrus, would you like to rebut? No, that's partly true. All right, thank you. Mr. Cyrus, we'll start with you for, on this question. Do you support Iowa's voucher program to private schools? Why or why not? Absolutely I do, and here's why. When you have the voucher program, half of the money is kept in the school that the student left. So they're reduced one student, but yet half the money remains. So the thing about it is, is the, the, the schools that take them and the Christian schools or whatever the private school is. That's more opportunities to have more teachers. We have to let the parents decide where they want their kids to be educated. The power is in the parents. And if we can have private enterprises teach the students and make them better, I think it'd be awesome. Truly, I would love to get all of our schools to be number one in the state and in the nation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm opposed to the uh, ESA, so-called ESA program, vouchers program. Uh, I, I want to be clear, I'm not opposed to private education. I think private education has a, an important role in our, the spectrum of education, you know, services that we have in the state. Uh, what I'm against is the funding mechanism. Uh, so, I was on the school board. I see what it takes to fund a public school district, and when you start to extract uh, dollars that used to go to a public school district for each pupil that moves to a private school, um, the fixed costs in that school district don't go down um, at, at the same ratio. So you've got uh, one student coming out of first grade, one out of sixth grade, and so forth. Um, you can't reduce a teacher, you can't pay less in light bills, and so forth. Um, so it, it's, it's a real serious funding problem for our public school districts that are already critically underfunded for more than a decade. And um, I have serious concerns about the future of our, our public education system with an unlimited appropriation like this. Thank you. Yeah, just briefly. Um, the whole thing is your fixed costs do always stay the same, but it is the students leave half that money still stays, and you have one less student to teach. Those are your variable costs. That's all. Sorry, half the money doesn't stay. I'm not sure where that number came from. Uh, 
there, there, there's not a provision to leave half the dollars in, in the public school district. There was some money that the public school districts got to keep, but it was nowhere near half of the, the funds. Um, so again, you know, totally opposed to this. Public dollars are for public schools. Uh, we, already, we already fund um, private schools through a variety of different ways from state dollars, uh, and um, I'm, I'm supportive of those things, you know, um, athletic uh, sharing agreements, uh, music programs, and so forth, but um, not, not this ESA thing. Thank you. Just to expand on that same topic a little, um, if all of our goals are to make the educational system as good as it possibly can be for all of Iowa, how do we deal with the discrepancy in reporting requirements between the public and private schools and how that impacts how we measure any kind of progress that we're making in terms of making our schools better? I think you get to start this time. I, you, you said it right there, um, Dr. Renfro. I, you know, that's another huge concern. With one minute to respond, sometimes it's hard to get all of these things out. So I appreciate the follow-up uh, question. The accountability is a huge concern. Um, private schools do not have to, first off, accept all of the school uh, the students that public schools do. Public schools, if they show up, we have to accept them. We have to educate them. That is the law. Um, private schools do not have to do that. And so special ed is the most kind of well-known example of that, that private schools often do not provide those services. Uh, but then on the accountability end, there are all kinds of account, uh, you know, reporting and so forth that public schools are required to report to the state department and, and others, to the federal government, that um, the private schools are not. So measuring progress um, it, is often impossible you know with our private school districts in the same way that we do with our public schools so um point well taken thank you for the question thank you mr Sires. when we were kids we had iowa test of basic skills and that was across the entire state and everybody was ranked off of that and you've always tested children and when they were in school and as a matter of fact we even had uh, iq tests and all kinds of other things but that was back in the uh, 60s and 70s and I am pretty old, I guess. But the thing about it is, is there are ways to test, and we need to get the people who know how to do that so we can bring up the level of our schools. We can't just run in the back. We can't be satisfied for 14th. We've got to figure out a way to do it. And if we don't have people that are in there to do it now, we need to. Some of these uh, superintendents were getting paid $300,000 a year. You could hire four teachers for that kind of money. So we've got to look into what the problem is and then fix it that way. Thank you. Would you like to rebut? Yes, please. I mean, if, I think what I heard was that we should have the same um, enrollment and accountability requirements for our private schools that we have for our public schools. If we're going to be able to compare them fairly, that, I think that's what I just heard. So I'd, I'd be all for that, especially if our public dollars are going to go to our private schools. Uh, we maybe have something that we agree on there. Um, so I'll... I'll be darned. I'll leave it at that. All Thank right. you. <clears throat> Would you like to take 30 again? No, we already agreed to it with me. That's good enough. I love it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cyrus, we'll start with you on this question then. Um, shifting topics a little bit. Thinking of the recent school shooting in Perry, Iowa, what can be done to ensure the safety of our students and our teachers? Well, that was one thing. Um, the security. Um, my opponent voted no on upgrading the security at the schools, which is actually quite shocking. Now, I would arm the teachers and I would make them very good, sh good shooters. That's just the way it is. You guys have different opinions than me and I'd be glad to have you guys run too. But here's the thing, the reality of it is we need the stronger doors, we need the better security up front, we need all these things because we're never gonna get rid of all of the people that have the mental disabilities that wanna come in and shoot kids. And we've gotta get ready and upgrade our security. And that was the one thing that really surprised me about Eric. Um, he had voted against upgrading security after that incident. Thank you, That's Mr. I yield. I, so, I, um, yeah, I stand by that vote. Uh, the, all of the measures that were in the bill 
uh, for school security are already available to our school districts. Uh, the problem was that our school districts can't get insurance um, to insure themselves when there are teachers that are, or other personnel that are armed in the schools. And so the, uh, the bill uh, changed a liability that would supposedly m make it where school districts could get insurance, but we found out that that's still not going to fix the problem. Uh, the insurance companies still aren't willing to provide affordable insurance to our school districts. So um, it's been, a, been an option. It's always been out there. This was a, a false solution uh, to school security. Um, and I want to thank the school districts, the reasonable school districts across the area, across this Senate district, who have rejected a bad idea like arming school personnel. Mr. Cyrus, would you like to rebut any of that? Yeah, no, he agreed that he voted against school security. That's good enough. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty then. Um, <laughs> Do you think that Iowa has dedicated an appropriate amount of funding to the mental health needs of Iowans? If so, why? If not, what do you think should be done? My turn. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, Iowa, I believe if you include Puerto Rico, Iowa is 51st um, in the country for mental health support from the state. Uh, it's, it's a huge problem linking back to school security issues if we you know that could be one of the potential uh, ways to address school safety would be to better fund mental health programs um, it's it's a shame it's a travesty we have uh, we have billions of dollars of surplus on the table in the state and as my opponent um, pointed out earlier the highest priority for what to do with that uh, that surplus has been to try to continue to cut taxes, cut income taxes, particularly down to the bone. Uh, when we, at a time when we have done things like s severely underfunded priorities like mental health, we have the resources to do it. We have a strong enough economy. We just need, we need the right priorities. Thank you. M mental health is a tough issue. Right here in Cedar Falls, I propose that we had a, have a psychologist on duty with our Cedar Falls Police Department, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Here's the thing, when, when students come to UNI and they get depressed, I want somebody to be right there if they're gonna think they're gonna take their life because these students, they're our priority when they're in Cedar Falls. We need to look after them. And that was one thing that really upset me. And when he says I don't get along with my other colleagues, the person I didn't get along with was the city manager because what he said to me when I proposed that he said, you know what, you don't sound like a conservative, you sound like a liberal. And I said, well, it's like this, some things society has to pay for, and these things are one of them. That's all, I yield. Sounds like we might agree again. Uh, I, you know, I think we need to fund our priorities, and we have money on the table. We ought to be funding things like mental health and a whole host of other things. There are, uh, there are a backlog of, um, of health, HHS waivers of different kinds that have not been paid. Uh, our, our public schools have been underfunded. Our regents' universities have been underfunded. We need to look at all of those priorities and take care of those things before we look at cutting our income tax even further. And I, by the way, I supported the last um, income tax bill, but we need to let that settle out in our economy and we need to look at funding our, uh, our priorities now. Let's see, can I rebut that? I don't, I lost track. Yes. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Oh, I just have something short. Um, the, the $2 billion surplus that we have is 20% of our budget for the state. The reason that we have that is because of our conservative spending. Uh, we've got to figure out the ways that are the best to spend that money. But it's over hard work and time that that money has piled up. And we need to all work together to figure out what the best way is. All right, thank you. Both of you have mentioned uh, funding, have mentioned uh, income taxes, changes to income taxes. I wonder if we can just talk about that a little bit more. Um, as you both know, Governor Reynolds has talked about even more changes to the state's income tax law and, and changes that, on top of changes that have already been made. 
wonder if you can clarify your positions a little bit as far as how far you want those changes to go with regards to the state income tax. And Mr. Cyrus, we'll start with you. Well, here's something funny that we had. Uh, when my wife had her job at the IRS, they talked about an added value tax. And it wasn't a sales tax. But that way, it got people to keep more of their money. So with, with the income effect, they spent more money. And that propelled our economy along. And that would have been in about 1984. So it isn't anything new. Some of the states are doing it. And it would be nice if we could learn from them and make ours even a little bit better. But we need to keep taxes down and regulations down so businesses can grow so we don't have the brain drain out of Iowa. Thank you. So a value added tax is just a different type of tax. Uh, so what I'm hearing is we want, uh, my opponent wants to continue to cut the income tax, but then institute a, a, a different type of tax to make up the taxes that are lost from the income tax cut. I, I, that's, that's just a shell game in my opinion. Uh, I think that we've cut taxes way further than we probably needed to. Uh, we had 20, I think we actually, we had it estimated at over $20 billion of uh, COVID relief funds in one form or another that were injected into the Iowa economy during the COVID time. Those dollars in lots of different ways made their ways into state coffer and they have really bolstered our economy. and in some ways produce the, uh, re the surplus revenue that we have right now. Uh, we have cut taxes quite a bit. I said it earlier, I supported one of those tax cuts. Uh, we need to let it settle out. The COVID money's done. It's not coming back. We need to let all of this settle out. We need to figure out where it's gonna kinda, kinda stop and then, then talk about potentially other kinds of tax cuts. But that's, uh, th that's my position on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cyrus, would you like to rebut? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I guess speaking of regulations, um, where did I go? Iowa is ranked 20th for air and water quality and 30th for drinking water. Uh, what can we do to improve the water issues in Iowa? Mr. Giddens? Well, um, we, you know, we know that th I, I appreciate one of our people here, Al, uh, from from Dysart is a, a very conservation-minded farmer that's in the district here. Now that we have the new, new more rural parts of this district after our redistricting, um, it, he, he does a lot of ag conservation practices that we need more widespread adoption across this state. Uh, I appreciate the work that he does and he's a leader in uh, sharing that work through organizations that he belongs to. Uh, I enjoy talking to him both at the Capitol and in Dysart when I go to Farm Bureau meetings. Um, we need more and more and more conservation on the land. Um, that's, that's the bottom line. We're, we're losing nutrients um, from our farming system and um, we, we got to keep them. And, uh, we, you know, it's expensive too uh, to, to fertilize. We need to keep that stuff uh, here on our property. So. Um, that's, that's where I'd start. I'm out of time. Thank you. As, as long as the clean air and water is voluntary to farmers, the farmers have already um, set aside 20 million acres for the grass edges and all these other grass things, and that was voluntary. And the cover crops are fantastic, too, that they do, because it's actually the drop of rain that loosens the soil and makes it run away. The one problem I have with the lower uh, nutrient levels is the government, the DNR, has almost become predatory on our small communities. Now, it's fine to go ahead and, and upgrade their specifications and, and the limits they have to meet, but for the state to then not help them pay for that. Uh, I'm thinking in particular LaPorte City. They had to spend $12 million on their wastewater treatment plant, and the thing about that was that's going to raise their sewer bill by $100 per household for the next 20 years. This part of this should have been covered by the state when you start to throw those regulations out of the blue. And a lot of the small communities had problem with that. Did you have to I, I agree, these, these are real problems that are very expensive. Um, and 
back to the resources issue, we need to not have cutting taxes to the bone as the highest priority. We need to look at pri real priorities like this, like helping our small communities with wastewater treatment plants when they can't afford them and they're passing those bills on to ratepayers through their water bills. Um, the state needs to step up, needs to use the surplus that it's got to help these communities um, and, and show that it is really truly a priority. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Thank you both. This question is for you, Mr. Cyrus. One in nine Iowans face food insecurity, and Iowa's food pantries saw an increase in those asking for help, particularly this last summer. What do we need to do to make this issue a priority, and how can we address it? Well, my wife works at the North Cedar Food Bank, and we contribute to that, and we also contribute to the food bank in Waterloo. Um, I've actually gone. Uh, we've actually gone through this. I had a guy who lost his job and lost his pension from Rath Packing, and on his porch, he would dig in the dumpster and froze all the milk and all the cottage cheese on his porch. And when I came there, I said, Dale, you can't have this. I said, you've got, you've got to, um, we got to throw this stuff away. And when I started to throw the stuff away, I said, I I'll take care of you. Don't ever worry about it. When I started to throw his food away, it was like a little kid and I was taking his toys. It, it was worse than that, the, the look on his face. I cleaned that up and luckily my wife's church at that time had a thing called Angel Box. And I think it was $20 a week, around about in there. And so when he'd pay his lot rent, I paid always so he had his Angel Box. This is truly a problem. When we went through COVID, Mike Michalichek had the backpack program. And my first $2,500 that I earned on city council, I paid to that. So that went straight to the backpack program, which also then went to the food bank. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Giddens? Uh, so I'd mention a couple of things that uh, have been problematic pro policy proposals recently at a time when this is truly a, b a big problem. Uh, one was an effort to institute an asset testing um, program where anybody who would qualify for public assistance would have to prove, uh, you know, or, or demonstrate the number of assets that they have, the amount of assets. It was a very, at the initial proposal, very low amount, something like $1,500 um, in assets. If they had more than that, then they wouldn't qualify for any sort of public assistance. So big program with a high administrative cost to the state that would result in kicking a lot of people off of public assistance at a time when they need that the most. Um, also, the summer EBT programs have been widely reported on. Uh, big, big problem. The state only needed to partner with the federal government for those programs and provide a $2 million match to leverage like an additional $20 million. And the governor um, unfortunately decided not to, to do that. So um, we have opportunities to help and we're not doing that. Thanks. Thank you. Anything, Mr. Sanders? Well, yeah, the sad thing about the limits on how much they can make, that goes with the family income. And I had a great 15-year-old kid that worked for me. He showed up on time. He worked late. He would do anything. And he was going to work till school started. He called me a week before and says, I got to quit because my mom's losing her food stamps because my income goes with hers. And he quit that day. And I couldn't believe it. So we've got to be careful when you set these limits. We need to set them so that everybody can eat. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Giddens. Any? Uh, we also just have to um, help people be able to more fully participate in our economy. Uh, we have a lot of people who have barriers to economic participation right here in the Cedar Valley in a, a myriad of ways. We, you know, we've got low unemployment. Uh, we've got lots of jobs um, sitting there waiting to be filled, but a um, segment of the population is highly unemployed or underemployed. We need to help get those people back into meaningful employment so that they don't have to go to the food bank. Um, thank you. Thank you. Did I get a rebut on that? Yes. Um, if you would like people to go out and make more money, why did you vote against them being required to go out and look for a job when they're unemployed? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, I'll have to look that up too. Let's avoid asking each other questions and just respond to the okay. questions at hand. But we can hang out afterward if you want to. One of the barriers that 
some might say is a barrier to working is the number of birthdays that somebody has had. So all of the child labor laws changed in Iowa last year. Mm. How's that for a segue? Um, mm-hmm. What oversight do you think should exist to monitor the pros and cons of this change? Uh, Mr. Giddens. I, I go first? Yes. Oh boy, the child labor law was definitely um, contentious uh, in the Capitol. Um, you know, I think we do have real workforce problems in the state. We, we, you know, we need to get more people working, um, but loosening our child labor laws and, and making dangerous working situations for children is not a way to address the workforce crisis. That's, that's absolutely the wrong way to do it. Um, so, uh, in addition to that, you know, I, I said earlier at one point that I talk, you know, a lot to our business leaders in the community here and keep in close contact with them. And one of the problems with the law was that it was out of compliance with federal child labor laws. So, uh, businesses that started employing children were beginning to get fined under this state law, were beginning to get fined by the federal government. And, um, so... Uh, that was a problem from the beginning that we warned folks about um, this this law conflicted with federal law and it turn, it did turn out that way so it's just the wrong way to, to address our workforce issues thank you mr. Sires that's one thing I'm very sensitive to as I told you that 15 year old kid that started to work for me this summer um, I told him I want you to come in at nine I want you to quit at four I said you're a kid I didn't work him too much he had a half hour off for lunch because he wanted only a half as opposed to an hour. But we've got to be careful. And I told him, I said, it's better for you to get good grades. And the thing that did shock me about him was he was going into 10th grade, but didn't know simple multiplication tables. And that was very sad. So anyway, a good kid. I am for not having kids work too long. I would like to see them have their driver's licenses one a little bit early if they can to drive to their jobs and those kinds of things. But to overwork kids is definitely wrong. All right, thank you. Mr. Cyrus, we'll start with you on this question. Um, Particularly given the nature of this district, it's sort of a microcosm for the state in terms of rural versus urban interests. Do you think the legislature is adequately balancing the needs of rural Iowans and urban Iowans? And what would you change, if anything, to try to restore that balance, if it is out of balance? Well, the nice thing is, is I was a farmer. And the rural part of this district, um, I've covered pretty heavily. And I did since I was young. So with my excavating business, I've been just about everywhere. Um, it, it's a different feel out in, in the other communities, but, it, but it's a great camaraderie. These, these people, they love each other. And uh, Cedar Falls, we always did, but it is a totally different kind of a, um, oh, I wanna say a different climate. But growing up in Cedar Falls and spending my entire life here, I do know the climate in Cedar Falls. I love Cedar Falls. There's no place better. I'll never move. And uh, we can have that delicate balance of country and city. Um, We did just get a little bit bigger on our farm area. I grew up with a lot of farmers. So it'll be fine as long as I get in there. Mr. Giddens. Thank you. I, I do want to say I love the new characteristics of this district. After the redistricting process, it did change from a, a almost totally metro-based district, as you noted, to a, now a district that has rural components down to the south, extending into Tama and Benton counties and, and all of Cedar Falls, a university metro-based town. Uh, I love that mix. You said it's a microcosm of the state. It really truly is. Uh, I've engaged in all of the communities across the district. I, lo- I, I, I love it. Um, I, I also want to share that just by nature, my personality is to be a collaborator, to work with everybody. And you can ask anybody in the Senate. I feel confident that all of my colleagues in the Senate will tell you that they like me, they enjoy working with me. Uh, and so having a district like this is really a great opportunity for me to take ideas from town and from, you know, the rural parts of the district back to my colleagues and to say, hey, this is what I'm hearing here and there. And they've already invited me to work with them on a number of different issues uh, in the next session. I'm looking forward to that. Can I rebut? Mine will be short. Uh, The Iowa Farm Bureau endorsed me as a friend to agriculture. They very seldom do that for a challenger that mostly goes to an incumbent. 
but uh, they thought I had what it take to, to help the rural areas, and that's what I'm going to do. Not only Cedar Falls, but the rural areas. That's all. Well, I, congratulations on that uh, support. I'm, I have the endorsement of the Iowa Corn Growers Association, uh, the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association, um, and other, other folks that I've worked with that represent, you know, ag groups uh, in the state. Uh, so, it, you know, it, all it takes is collaboration, talking to people, doing what you can to find some common ground, going down there, working together with folks, and that's what I love doing, and I look forward to continuing to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Giddens, what is the single most pressing concern that constituents that you've been talking to have expressed to you, and if elected, what will you do about it? Uh, thank you. I, I will say I've knocked um, on 9,000, approximately 9,000 doors in the last 16 months talking to constituents all over this district in uh, every community. So I have a really good sample of, of folks from every community and public education is what rises to the top. You know, it's, um, it's the largest thing that state government funds uh, is our education system from pre-K all the way up through our universities. And um, it's been underfunded for a long time. Uh, the attack on the AEAs, the area education agencies this last session touched so many people. Um, just an outpouring of opposition to that, uh, that um, you know, to that bill. And I'm gonna do what I can to continue to fight for, to stand for our public education system, all the way from pre-K up through our Regents universities, including and especially the University of Northern Iowa. Thank you. There's so many different ones. Um, I just happen to be on the page that's pr protecting girls' sports. Um, girls should have their own sports and not allow boys to be in it. That's one of the things that I've heard a lot of. Um, School choice, like he said, education, that, that's a big thing. Tax reductions, I can just skip through my book here. Um, there's a lot of different things, but the one thing is, is they don't have someone who's sympathetic to what they're thinking about at the time. Um, they'd like somebody that truly represented them. They, they said with me, uh, I'm pretty easy going, and I also um, have had the same kind of experiences they've had in the farming or whether it's business or whatever it might be. So uh, there's a lot of different things, the girls and girls sports. Um, yeah, I could go on and on. That's all. Thank you. Um, the, I talked about it earlier. We've got a number of cu culture war issues that are brought up every year that are absolute distractions. Um, from the real problems that we need to be addressing in this state. Uh, and if you want to talk about education problems, we have stagnant test scores. We have too many good teachers that are leaving this state. We've got a billion dollars in you know, unlimited appropriations is the estimate that's going to flow from our public schools over to the private school system in an unaccountable um, un, you know, voucher system scheme that we frankly can't afford. So uh, we got lots of real problems we need to address and we need to get away from all the culture war stuff. Thank you. Well, thank you both. We're now at the portion of the debate where we need to ask for closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Sires, we'll start with you. Well, I love this district. I've lived here my entire life. Uh, as I said, I have a hundred year span here and, and that's quite striking. Um, my mother grew up right around UNI. She's a teacher. She went to UNI. Um, they lived on Walnut Street, and uh, the thing about that is, is when the college closed for the summer or for the winter, she, they would take in renters. They'd rent, rent the rooms. It was, it's a huge, it's still there, the house they lived in. But the one funny thing that happened was she went ahead and uh, they had a person from Florida that couldn't go home. That person, when she did go home, sent an alligator back to my mom in a box about that big. And my mom raised that alligator up. And my mom's not real outdoorsy like my dad was, but she raised it up and that thing was in the garden center up there at UNI for many years. When I was a little kid, I used to go in there and take a look at it. It's just a nice story. Um, I'm gonna do a lot of things when I get in there, but uh, we've got to remember the humanitarian part of everything. And I love UNI, Cedar Falls, and everything in the district. I'll do a good job.
Thank you. Mr. Giddens. Thank you. I, I just want to say a lot of thank yous for this evening and for this opportunity. Thank you to Mr. Sires for uh, for uh, thank you to doing you too. this. I appreciate it. Hey. Uh, Northern Iowa Northern Iowa Student Government, our student body president, um, Elizabeth Montavo, thank you for your leadership uh, in organizing this. The Women's Women of Action, Panthers Vote, uh, Dr. Renfro, Dr. Larimer, thank you for moderating. Really grateful for you. Uh, Denny Bowman is somewhere in the in the background. He does the Channel 15 um, broadcast. Really grateful for his work in putting this together. Um, Thank you to all of the volunteers that have participated in my campaign. I've had uh, about 50 different people that have come out to help volunteer, and I'm really, really proud of the campaign that we've run. We're looking forward to pushing all the way through November 5th. Um, thank my girlfriend, Allison, and my campaign manager, Dylan Morgan, wherever he is. Um, looking forward to these last few weeks of the campaign and to getting back to work for you um, in January in Des Moines. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank both of you for being here. Um, how lucky we are to have two candidates who are so dedicated to our area. Thank you. I want to thank Dave Sires and Eric Giddens for agreeing to participate in tonight's debate. I extend best wishes to the respective campaign and request that registered voters in Iowa Senate District 38 exercise their constitutional right and vote on Tuesday, November 5th. My gratitude is extended to two professors of political science at the University of Northern Iowa, Jamie Renfro and Chris Larimer, for being our moderators. As you can see, they are masters, so thank you. Thank you, Denny Bowman of Cedar Falls Cable Channel 15 for working with our candidates, the moderators, timekeepers, and four sponsors of this evening debate, namely Northern Iowa Student Government, Women of Action, Panther Vote, and Cedar Falls Waterloo Branch of the American Association of University Women of Iowa. The TV services you provide to the public are highly valued. To our viewers, this debate will be made available on the Cedar Falls Channel 15 YouTube channel in about a week. Don't forget to mark your calendar to vote November 5th. Thank you, and good night. Well, not too much bloodshed. Not too bad.